Hello. Okay, everyone's starting to enter. Okay. Okay, it looks like most people are here by now. I just want to get a list. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch to screen. Does everybody hear me? Do I have my microphone on and all that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Let me go switch to screen sharing. Oh, there. Okay, um. All right, is the, you should see my desktop by now, right? Okay, okay, so we're gonna pick up where we were talking on Tuesday. First of all, let me say, there's uh, there's a homework assignment, well, there was a homework assignment due on Tuesday. There's a new one, but it's not up there yet. I, I hope it'll be up there this evening, okay? So I'm working on it. So I wanted, to, yeah, it'll be definitely up there in a, it, you know, by tomorrow sometime. So I went ahead and put here that you should you know, look for the homework assignment to be there today or tomorrow. But again, right now it's not quite there yet. Okay. So there's gonna be, another, and there'll be a homework assignment about what we're talking about today using the scene package, the, the scene data structures. Okay. All right. And let's see. Okay, so let me download these zip files. Okay, and let me just unzip them real quick. Okay. All right. Now, first, let's, okay. Just real quick, go over what we talked about before. Okay. Just remember the render you know, is the algorithm that takes the scene data structure in and gives you a frame buffer out. You want to take a picture of a scene. This thing is the thing that takes the picture. It produces the picture in the frame buffer, and this describes the picture. Okay. Then what we really want to talk about is the scene data structure. Then we'll be talking about these algorithms next week. Okay. The scene data structure here, there was, it was a tree. This is the best way to summarize it here. A scene holds a camera because you, you need something to take the picture with. So we, we model that as a camera object then we're taking a picture of something. We consider that a list of models. There's models in the scene. So you got a bunch of models in the scene. And then here's the key idea. How do we model models? We think of a model as a list of points. Now remember, we could just stop there, have a list of points and just use lots and lots of points. We did that, the idea there is what's called point clouds. You could model using just points, but it's a little bit awkward. It doesn't work so great. So what we do is we supplement the points with line segments, and later on we'll be supplementing them with triangles. Okay. The but here we just outline the object. If you're going to do nothing but points, you need to fill in the object with points. 
So if you want a sphere made out of points, you have to plot thousands and thousands of points to fill out the sphere. But if you want to plot a point, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna plot maybe a, a hundred or so points on the sphere and connect them with line segments to sort of fill in between the points, okay? And then later on, we'll fill in the points with, with triangles, okay? So we have an outline of the object in points and then the points are connected by line segments. But we, the points are vertices that hold X, Y, Z coordinates in space. And the line segments are a little bit tricky. Each line segment has two endpoints. So it points to, it makes a reference to two of these vertices. So every line segment makes a reference to two vertices. And it does it by storing the integer index of where you are in this list, of where a vertex is in this list. Okay, so if this line segment could point to the first vertex and the second vertex by storing a zero and a one. Okay, okay. now we want, let, let's go and talk about the camera a little bit. And then later, the rest of the day, we'll be talking about this stuff. Look at examples of doing it. That's what your homework assignment, your homework assignment, the next one is gonna really be emphasizing this, this part of it. The model is a list of vertices and a list of line segments. But it's worth talking a little bit about the camera right now, because if you don't understand the camera, it's kind of hard to figure out some of the, the things that can go wrong when you're working with models. Okay, now, Here's some pictures. There's a zip file up on the website that's just called rendering. It's actually just got pictures in it, okay? So here's that folder called rendering, okay? And the camera is what does projection. So in this folder projection, here's a picture of the idea of what we're wanting to do, okay? This is a scene it's got three objects in it. Th this is where the camera is. A lot of people call it the center of projection, COP. So that's where the camera is. And the objects in the scene, they're being projected to the camera. See, this is, or, or if you want to think, think of this as your eyeball, your eyeball looks out using light rays and sees things. Or light rays, actually what they really do is light rays come off of some light source, bounce off of objects, and enter your eye. And we want to more or less model this idea. Okay. Now, if you put a piece of film here, when a piece of light comes through and hits that film, you can record what amount of light is there. That's what a that's what a modern camera does. This, this film here is called the liquid crystal display, the LCD in a camera. And when light comes in, it records what what light was came in there. For us, this is the frame buffer. In a sense, this is we really think of the frame buffer sitting right there. And what the frame buffer holds is how what what did this line, what did the eye see going out that line? What did the line see going out that line? What did the line see going out that line? That's what's stored in the frame buffer. Okay. So the camera is this guy here. The frame buffer kind of is right here. I mean, we're not going to actually write our code to look like this picture, but this is the picture we're trying to emulate. We want the frame buffer to capture what the eye sees on each ray coming out of the eye. If you actually write a render literally like this picture, is, it's called a uh, ray caster or ray tracer. The, the, there's a style of renders, like Pixar's are this way. It's a style of render called ray tracing or ray casting, where, where it really models this picture real accurately. We're not gonna, our algorithm is the kind of algorithm that a game uses. A game and a GPU, your graphics card doesn't do this. It, it, it's trying to simulate this, but it, it, a ray tracer actually literally does this. It, it shoots out rays and then it has this, it, it shoots rays through essentially a data structure and whatever it, it hits, it records that in the data structure, okay? So we simulate this picture and a ray tracer actually executes this picture, okay? So this is the idea we wanna get. We wanna get the, the, we want the frame buffer at each pixel to be holding what the camera would see as it looks out that pixel, okay? Now here's another, here's, a, here's another way of thinking about it. The camera's sitting here, okay? 
and the camera looks out into space. Now, this is closer to what we're going to be doing. The camera sees what's in a view volume. The camera only sees what's enclosed in this box-like shape. If something's outside that box, the camera doesn't see it. Okay, your eyes don't see everything in front of you. Your eyes have what we call a field of view. You see what's in your field of view. People who are unfortunate to have tunnel vision are people who have a small field of view. They don't see very much to the right and very much to the left, okay? Every camera has a notion of what it can see and what's outside of its field of view. Now, the human eye has a field of view that's round and binoculars and telescopes have a field of view that's round. Cameras in computer graphics could have a round field of view, but round field of view don't match up windows very well. You know, windows are square. So since we're projecting onto a desktop, onto a, computer, a, a, a window in a graphics system, graphics cameras have a rectangular field of view. So your eye, a movie camera, Black, uh, the lens in a movie, uh, movie cameras are kind of, and actually real physical cameras are a little bit complicated because a real camera has a circular field of view, but it has a rectangular film. Okay, The film is actually rectangular in a real camera, but the lens sees a round field of view. So that makes them a little bit tricky. Your, and your eyeball, your eyeball has a round retina in the back. This would be like what the retina is in your eyeball. The, it has a round retina and has a round field of view. Okay. In a computer graphics system, we have the camera with a, rec, a, a rectangular view volume and a rectangular field of view. Okay. Then what's out in front of the camera, we want to project it to the, this is like, this is going to be our frame buffer again. See, this models our frame buffer. We want to project what's out in front of the camera into the frame buffer and, and figure out what pixels to paint in the frame buffer, depending on what the camera sees in front of it. From, yeah, now that's the algorithms. When we start talking about the algorithms, we're gonna talk about how do you get from the 3D to the 2D. Right now, you wanna see that, that when I realize that first, what's important is that the camera only sees some of what's in front of it. If something is out of the field of view, if it's outside of that box, the camera doesn't see it. Okay. Right. Here's another picture of that same thing. Okay. The camera's sitting here. This is the shaded, you know, here's the view volume. We call it the view volume. What volume of space the camera sees. Here's an object in view volume. When you shoot a picture or when you render things, the objects get projected to the front screen. Or this is this is where we think of see now here he shows it that over here is the frame buffer so the frame buffer is not really sitting here in the picture the frame buffer is over here see he calls it an open gl window okay so we need to, our algorithms are going to have to figure out how some object in the view volume gets projected to the front and then gets copied over into the frame buffer that would be the algorithms now, the frame buffer's got a lot of parameters. There is its left edge, its right edge, its top edge, its bottom edge, its front face, which is called, whoops, called near. Whoop. Okay, the, 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 you notice that there's all these faces of the view volume, a top face, a right face, a bottom face, and there's a parameter for each one. The left face is called the left. Yeah, there's a number. What that number is, is how many, it's, if you think of there being an X, Y axis here, he didn't draw it in his picture. In another picture, it'll, be, it'll show up. There's an X, Y axis in this front face. Left is the, over here on the X axis. Where are you on the left X axis? That's left. How far is this edge on the right axis? That's uh, right. Okay, see that he's writing this as a coordinate in three dimensional space. So the X coordinate is the first coordinate, the X coordinate is the left first coordinate. This corner down here, this is actually the coordinates of this corner down here. Remember, we described left rectangles by their things like their upper left hand corner, lower right hand corner. This is the coordinates of the upper left hand corner left, top, 
near, left bottom near. Okay, uh, for quirky reasons, we're, remember we're looking down the negative z axis. We've mentioned that we're working down the negative z axis. People in computer graphics like to think of this front as a positive number. So it's called near. How near is that front to the camera? But then its coordinate is negative at near because people prefer positive numbers. So they measure this positive distance, but it's on the negative z axis. So the actual coordinate is negative near. Kind of quirky. Um, everybody does it that way. Everybody prefers positive numbers. So near, you think of near is the distance from the camera to this front. Okay. In our graphic system, that near is always going to be one. For it for a while, we're going to keep the near always at one. Actually, all these numbers are going to be one. Left will be one. Well, left will be negative one, right will be positive one, top will be positive one, bottom will be negative one, and near will be one. So this thing is going to be at negative one unit behind the camera. Okay. All right. And then there's actually a, a back plane, which our camera doesn't even have yet. Well, that'll be added later. The point of the back plane is you don't see things that are behind it. That helps games. Uh, when something gets real far away, it becomes so small, you don't see it. So it's better off to just chop off everything that's far away. So you, the, the renderer doesn't try to draw things that are actually so small, they're not visible anyway. So most computer graphic systems have a back plane, which cameras don't have. Real cameras, you just see, you know, you just see things forever. You know, that's why you can have cameras that take pictures of the moon and things like that. So real cameras do not have a back plane, but graphics cameras do to optimize things. When things get real far away, they're so small that they're not usually very, it's not worth rendering them anymore. So everything behind the back plane gets chopped off. Right now, our renderer doesn't have that back plane. We'll add it later on. To keep things simple, we won't have a back plane. Okay, so, so this is a good picture of that 3D box. You know, it's, the name of this is a frustum. Okay, see, it's because it's, 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 like it's like a pyramid that's been chopped off at this end. So it's called a frustum. So it's the viewing frustum. Okay, here's a side view of it. And what the side view is showing you is how it's actually, you know, why is it that things that are farther away appear smaller? And this little picture kind of gives you a sense. See, here's two figures of the same height. See, they're the same height. But what does the camera see? The camera sees this guy as, see, he subtends a bigger arc. Or if you want, he projects to the front that type. See, here's, uh, this, is, this is B, he's the front one. This is A, he's the back one. B projects to this height. A projects to this height. From the camera's point of view, A is shorter than B. That's because A is farther away. And that's intuitively what you want. Things that get farther away appear smaller. And it's because of this projection idea. So that you can see this little picture encompasses almost all computer graphics. Why is it that things that are farther away appear smaller? And it's because they project to a shorter line segment here than something the same. This B and A are the same height, but B projects to something larger than what A projects to. Okay, you notice that real well when you look at it as a side view like this. So that's a side view of this thing. So it's just looking at it from the side. When you get rid of the 3D part of it, it makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this picture into formulas. And the renderer does this as a calculation. So we'll see that the renderer is gonna compute these points. The renderer is gonna take these points, compute these points. It's gonna take these points in 3D space and compute these points over here. And then it's gonna do another step to transfer those points into the frame buffer. So we're gonna take a point in space, do a calculation to figure out where it projects to here, then we'll do another calculation to figure out where it goes to in the frame buffer. Okay, that'll be what the renderer does. Okay. Here's a, another picture of the same idea. Yeah, this globlet's real far, be, real far away in the view volume, and it projects to, over to here. This goblet projects to there. So they're showing you the lines of projection. It's kind of a nice picture. I wish it was bigger. I, I, I'm not very good at drawing pictures. I, if, if I 
if I was a little bit more skilled at pics, I just download these from the internet. Yeah, I look for pictures on the internet. I should look, um, right now they're a little bit small. I, I should try to find bigger ones. Uh, you can magnify them though they get blurry if you magnify them. They get a little bit blurry when you magnify them. But what they're showing here, these lines are called the projectors. They project a point on the object to the, what we're gonna call the projection plane. The object over here, remember, is made up of a bunch of vertices and line segments. A real important point is we only project the vertices. We won't project the line segments and we'll see why. So that goblet's made up of a bunch of points and then the solidness of the, like that stem there, the goblet, there's a point down here and there's a point up there. Only the endpoints of that vertical line get projected. The line segment won't be. And we'll see why as we go along, okay? So the, the render only, it doesn't project the whole object. It projects the vertices of the object. Because once you've projected the vertices of the object, that line segment that connects those two points can easily be drawn down here as a line segment connecting the two projected points. So we won't need to project the line segments. Once we projected a vertex and it's another vertex, we can reproduce the line segment down here. And that's the trick of modern computer graphic systems. That's one of the real, that's one of the reasons why we don't, we use this idea of vertices and line segments. It makes this thing actually kind of pretty efficient. The goblet's described maybe by 50 points, and then there's a bunch of line segments. When you project, you don't project the whole thing, you project the 50 points. Okay. And then down here, you'll connect the 50 points down here with line segments, but you don't project the line segments. That's a lot less work. You're not doing calculations on all the points in the line segments. That's actually the secret, in, the real secret to these algorithms is that you don't project the stuff between the vertices. You only project the vertices and then down here, you can reconnect them after you projected them. Okay. Now here's, the reason I have this picture is because there's this other picture. We have two kinds of projections and this is a good example, do a good comparison of the two. This is called perspective projection. You can see it in the title of the picture. And this is called parallel or orthographic projection. Here you just project, yeah, you know, the objects are in space and here's where the frame buffer is, so to speak. Here you just project parallel. You project in parallel straight to the frame buffer instead of projecting as if there was, see here we pretend there's an eyeball down here. So all the light rays have to enter the eyeball. So that is what we really have. We have eyeballs and all the light comes from objects around us into our eyeball. The beauty of that is you see this stuff of, of something far away appear smaller. When this system is used, far objects far away appear the same height as objects close up because everything is projected in parallel. So the height of this goblet doesn't matter how far back that goblet is. The height of this goblet doesn't depend on how far back that goblet is. You just project in parallel. This is not what your eye does. We'll see as we go along, these kinds of projections are useful for, for uh, mechanical drawing. They're used in CAD systems. So, so 3D design systems, computer-aided design systems, what engineers use actually do this kind of graphics. Games don't use this. Games and movies use this. But 3D design systems that engineers use for designing use this, and we'll see why as we go along. So there's these two gra graphics projection systems, perspective projection and orthographic projection. This one has advantages and of course, this one has advantages. They both have advantages. Okay? And mostly this is, simulates our eyes. So this one makes graphics look more natural to us. This one, surprisingly, if you, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, when we look at pictures, we'll see that this doesn't really look all that unnatural. There's even a few games out there that are in orthographic projection because it's a little bit faster. There's less calculation to do than there is here. So if you have an old game that ran on old hardware, sometimes they ran an orthographic projection just to save CPU time. So some of the games in the early days were actually run this way. 
and all CAD systems work this way for another, not to, not to make things faster, but for another reason. Basically, it's so that you can compare links. Uh, as we'll see, this, this causes lots of distortion of links because far away things look smaller. Here, here, when you're here, the advantage of this thing, if somebody gives you a, a, draw, a picture taken this way, you can measure every item in the picture with a ruler. You can take your 2D picture and measure the edges in the picture and figure out how long things are. You can calculate the size of every object in the picture by taking the 2D picture. You can't do that here. You can't do that here. If you have a perspective projection, I give you a picture, like I give you a photograph of a building, you can't really tell me how tall the building is. That's actually a weird thing. It's not easy from photographs to measure things. You, you, know, you need a lot more information than just what's in the photograph. You need to know exactly where the camera was positioned. You have to know how various settings on the camera when the picture was taken. And you have to hope that somebody isn't manipulating things. We'll see in a minute what I mean by that. So if you use perspective projection, you actually cannot measure things from the picture. But you always can with this. If you give me a picture taken this way, cameras can't do this though. So if I give you a picture taken this way, it was drawn by a computer. It wasn't taken by a camera. As far as I know, there's no such thing as a camera that does orthographic projection. But if I give you a picture that's an orthographic projection, you can get out a ruler, measure everything in the picture and tell me how big the, th the original thing was. Okay, all right, here's another, here's another example of the same idea. Okay, here's a cube in space projected to the front near plane and then here's what its image looks like so this is what uh this is what a cube looks like when you look at it from 3d point of view so this eye sees the cube flat like that okay and we'll, we're gonna that's what we're gonna do examples of we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna you know when you draw a cube you know if you're not careful it's not gonna end up looking like a cube like if you just look at that picture you might think it was a picture frame you know, what is it going to make us think that that's a picture of a cube? Here we see a cube in 3D. If you stare straight at a cube in 3D from the front, it doesn't look very cube-like. Notice we're not looking at it from the front here. We're looking at it what's called obliquely. We're looking at it from at an angle, and it looks very cube-like. But when the eye is dead set in front of it, you end up with a picture that doesn't very look very cube-like. Okay. Okay. Um, now. That, that last one I showed you, this is going to be, we're going to use, the, we're going to go back to this later on. This is going to be the formulas. We're going to derive the formulas for projection. When we start talking about the algorithms, we're going to go back and go through these ideas and derive all these formulas. And then these formulas are encoded directly into the, to the render. Okay, so that'll be the math part. We'll do that later. Okay, now I want to show you, there's some real nice demos of this on the internet. So here's a live demo of this. Well, actually, let me open that in a separate tab. Okay, here's a demo of a camera in space. The camera's right there looking at that object. And here's what the camera sees. So here's, what, here's what's in 3D space. Here's what the camera sees. Now, and I can, if I want, I can kind of move this around to just see it from different points of view. But the notice that this doesn't change here because the camera is always seeing the same thing. Over here, you can adjust the camera. Now, our render to begin with is a render where, now the field of view, let me just adjust it. The field of view is how wide the camera is. Our field of view is always gonna be 90 degrees. So we're gonna have a 90 degree field of view camera at the, begin, at the beginning. So it's a 90 degree field of view. The aspect ratio is, is the camera, what's, is the film square or rectangular in the camera? That's called the aspect ratio. Like here's a camera with rectangular film. The view volume is a rectangle. The view volume is not square. We're gonna have a square camera. See, the camera now is perfectly square, okay? And the near plane for us will actually be zero, but this one won't let you get it. And the far plane for us will be infinite, okay? And then you can also control over here some things that, you know, 
you, you can control where the cameras, uh, let's see, what's this one do? This one controls where the camera's pointing at. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll put that into the camera later on. Now, let me show you, in our render, let me switch to the code here for a minute. If we look at the, let's look at the render code. Here's the camera class, what's in it? Eventually, what's gonna be in it is all this data. This is all the data that describes a camera. But for now, we've got a really simple camera. Most of this data is gonna be hard coded, not as numbers just built into the camera. And right now the camera is actually incredibly trivial. It's just a Boolean that remembers whether it's a perspective camera or an orthographic camera. And all the other parameters are just gonna be hard coded into the renderer at this point. So to keep things simple, this camera has a 90 degree field of view. Its position is negative one on this edge, positive one on this edge, positive one on this edge, negative one down here. So its position is you know, from positive one to negative one, from positive one to negative one. And it's got that, which, which is actually what gives it the ni a 90 degree field of view. The, the angle you see here, if you look straight down, the angle you see from here to here to here, that's a 90 degree angle. Doesn't really quite look like it, but that's a 90 degree angle, okay? That's the field of view. If I change the field of view, I'm opening and see, I'm opening and closing that angle. See that, we call that the field of view, okay? A 90 degree field of view is when you go from the same amount to the left, and the same out to the right. In our case, we're going from negative one on the left to positive one on the right. So that gives us a 90 degree field of view, okay? All right, so our camera is real simple at this point. It only remembers whether it's doing, now this is a perspective projection on this picture. Our camera just remembers whether it's supposed to do a perspective projection. So true for perspective projection and false for orthographic projection. And there's a, and I, for, for reasons of future reference, you actually call a method to change from projection to orthographic. So you call project perspective to set this to true. You call project orthographic to set this to false. Later on, these methods will do a lot more changes in the camera when we switch from a projective camera to an orthographic camera. You can switch the camera back and forth anytime. So we'll see that in another demo. At any given time, a camera, can be at a certain place and just switch itself from orthographic to, per, or, uh, to perspective. So the camera just can be told at any given time, switch between, switch from here to here, switch from being perspective to being orthographic. And then th you'll get different pictures out of the camera, but at any given time, you can put the camera in a place and then switch between those, okay? All right, so this shows you one, this is one example of, uh, of what, what it looks like. Now, later on, we'll play around with how we'll start saying like, why does this image on the left change? You know, notice that what I'm doing is zooming in on the teddy bear. And notice that zooming in is about the field of view. Okay. Over here, if I change the near plane, when the near plane hits the teddy bear, you start chopping him off. Okay, so the near plane actually, the camera doesn't see what's in front of the near plane. Okay, that's to prevent things. Well, that's, that's just, again, that's a, that's a trick to make the camera a little bit more efficient. It's not what near, real, real cameras, your eyeball doesn't have a near plane. Your eye, no, no real camera has a near plane, but this is a little trick that it, it's useful for graphics. Similarly, the far plane, no camera has a far plane, but notice if I bring the far plane to, yeah, as the far plane moves forward, as he passes through the teddy bear, the teddy bear starts getting cut off because any part of the teddy bear that's behind the far plane is invisible anymore. No real camera or eyeball works that way, but computer graphics has found that useful. It's useful to have a far plane and a near plane. And we'll see later why you would want them. Our camera right now doesn't have them. Okay, so right now the camera that we're using in this simple render doesn't even have a far or near plane we'll see that ca that causes kind of funny things here's another demo of, of, of similar of more or less the same idea for somebody else's way of doing it okay 
Here's an eyeball looking out into space. There's three cubes in front of him. Notice that the idea here is that the cubes aren't entirely inside of the view volume. So what the eye sees is he sees the center cube and sees part of this cube on the right and part of this cube on the left. Okay. And if you change the you can change the field of view. If you change the field of view, you see more. You also notice if you narrow the field of view, you're zooming in on that one cube in the middle. So changing the field of view has the effect of being acting like zooming in and zooming out. That's not how a real camera does zooming. If you know, if you if you like photography, you, you might find this kind of quirky because th this is not quite what a real camera does for zooming. But in computer graphics, the field of view essentially is the ability of the camera to zoom in and zoom out. Okay. And then I can do this near plane, far plane thing, which see if I move the near plane away from the camera at some point he starts lopping off the volume the cubes see now the cubes are sticking through the near plane it's kind of a neat effect but the cubes are slight now no again no real eyeball can do this no real camera can do this but this is considered useful for computer graphics and the same with the far plane if i bring the far plane forward it'll start chopping off the backs of those guys but you don't see their backs see but until they start chopping off, you know, at first you don't even see the fact that the backs are being cut off because you don't see the backs, but then eventually you start seeing where the, now the fronts are being cut off a little bit, okay? So now only the very, very front of the cubes stick through the, re, the far plane, okay? All right, and he also has one more control over here, which actually, well, the other control is how far away, okay, let me show you. He's got Z position. Now he's actually confused this. This is not a camera control, but it's kind of, a, so let me see, what, in what sense is this not a camera control? What's moving when I move the slider? The position of the objects. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it seems to be changing the position of the objects. The objects are moving away from the camera. Now, let me change my point of view. Now I claim it is a camera control. Now I claim I'm not moving the objects, I'm controlling the camera. What am I doing? I claim now I'm not moving the objects. I claim to be moving the camera. Could that be true? If you're taking a picture of somebody and you want them farther away, there's two you're things- You're stepping back. Pardon me? You're stepping back. Yeah, you could, notice it's completely ambiguous. Whether, no, think of it, you're going to take a picture of somebody. You want them farther from the camera. There's two points of view. Move what or move what? Either move the objects or either move the camera. Yeah, and you can't tell the difference between them. And that's what's mm -hmm. happening here. Yeah, it's ambiguous whether this is moving the objects or moving the camera. Is it moving the camera farther away from the objects or is it moving the objects farther away from the camera? You actually can't tell the difference. Now, in the real world, you can tell the difference. Now, think real hard. You've got, you're, you're standing there facing someone and they're, you know, and you want them to, be, them to be farther away from the camera. You could have them step back or you could step back. In the final picture, you can tell which one was done, but how? Background changes? Yes, the background. If, if the object moves away from the camera, the background won't change. If the camera moves away from the object, the stuff in the background, which isn't moving, gets farther away. Now, there's no background here, so we can't tell. But if there was a background here, we could tell whether it was moving the object or moving the camera. 
And that's kind of the stuff we'll have to worry about when we do 3D graphics. Yeah, you know, we have to we have to pay attention to a lot of these things, and real and photographers pay attention to these things. So if you have no background, you can't tell if you're moving the object or moving the camera. But if you have background objects, then you can tell, because when you move the camera, the background objects are farther away and they get smaller. When you move these objects, you're not touching the background objects. So if these move farther back, they'll they'll get smaller, but the background object won't change. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, now here's one more demo of this, of this stuff. This is kind of a weird demo. It, what it does is, it, it's, it's actually real clever. You have, here, here's, what, here's the camera and here's what the camera sees. What the, what the, I had the idea was he'd make the camera spin around and change shape all the time while it's looking at these two objects over here. Actually, it's looking at three objects. It's looking at like a planet and a moon. And there's a, there's actually, see there's a little blue dot right there in front of the camera that's not moving. That's this blue guy here. So there's three spheres. There's one sphere sitting in front of the camera, not moving. Then there's a sphere way out here and a sphere, a green one here. And then, but, and as the camera rotates, the camera changes its shape. So it's essentially zooming in and zooming out on those objects. And when it, yeah, uh, and also these objects are spinning around, like the green sphere is rotating around the white sphere. So sometimes the green sphere, see now the green sphere is outside the far plane. Now notice that the green sphere has kind of come around and he's inside, see now he's, he's inside the far plane and he's actually closer than this guy. So it's kind of weird, it's, like, it's a little bit weird because it's moving around, it's not static. Now, here's one thing I like about this. If you use the O and the P keys, you can change between perspective and orthographic projection. Those other two demos only do perspective projection. I wish they kind of switch. I wish they had a button for switching between perspective and orthographic. This one's the only one that does. So if I hit the O key, I'm doing, see now, see the volume is cube now. See how the volume is not a frustum, it's a cube now. So here's perspective. And you can see it's, it's coming out of that eyeball. There's really an eyeball there. So this is emphasizing looking out of an eyeball. Orthographic projection, there's no real eyeball. You know, there's, I mean, you, you can think of there being an eyeball there, but you know, everything's being projected straight back to this whole plane. It's not being projected into the eyeball, okay? And so you get a different, you get it. Notice that on the left, it's, it's, it's not wildly different on the left. Well, actually it is. The, the, the big difference is uh, when pers with perspective projection, the biggest difference is when things move away and get closer and move away and get closer, they don't change their size. The, and, oh, I know, I, he did something, actually, the big difference is actually his fault. Why is that sphere growing right now? And why is that white sphere shrinking right now? And why is that white sphere growing again? It's not getting closer to the camera. What's happening? Changing the field of view. Yeah, it's zooming in. The field, the, the, the camera is zooming in on the white sphere and zooming out on the white sphere because the field of view keeps changing. For some reason, he didn't do that in the orthographic projection. He should have, to make the two examples similar, that cube should have been shrinking and growing. I mean, he could have done it that way. And if he had that cube shrinking and growing, the white sphere over here would be growing and shrinking. You could zoom in with an orthographic camera, just like you can zoom in with a perspective camera. I don't know why the guy who wrote this didn't make the two, two demos analogous. So this one, He's, as he's spinning it around, it's zooming in and zooming out on the three spheres. So that's why they grow and shrink. Here, he got rid of the zooming, which he didn't have to. There's no reason why a, uh, a camera can't change, an orthographic camera, it can change its shape. It would always be a, a cube, but the cube can get narrower and wider, taller. Yeah. 
Yeah, so he could have made these size change. It seems like they're changing a little bit, but notice that this sphere never changes its size. So he's not zooming in. He's not really changing the uh, shape. He's not changing the uh, size of this thing. The green sphere comes and goes because he's moving around the white sphere and sometimes he's just outside the far plane. And then see, now he just popped inside the far plane. And then in a little while, he'll swing around and pop outside of the far plane. See, now he's outside the far plane. And he's about to move back inside of the far plane. So he pops in and out because he's moving in. And the same thing over here, he's popping in and out of the picture because he's moving in and out you know, from both sides of the far plane. But at the same time, the camera is zooming in and zooming out. Okay. Right. So I kind of wish he, you know, I mean, if I wanted to, I probably should try this. There's his source code. To go in and, you know, change the source code. Figure out where is it that he didn't change the zooming on the orthographic projection. Um, here's a kind of cute thing to point point out. The guy who wrote this program is the guy who wrote this very famous uh, graphic system called Mr. Doob. Okay, so he wrote this demo. So he wrote this thing called 3JS, which has become really popular. It's the way to do 3D graphics in JavaScript. So he wrote this. He's got a funny coding style. He's in love with blank lines. He puts blank lines around everything, which drives me nuts when I'm reading his code. He puts blank lines everywhere. Yeah, really extreme sense of spacing. Now notice, he, for some reason, he didn't put too many blank lines here, but he puts blank lines around every brace. Some, some of his functions, he'll have a blank line around almost every single, like this one's real, you know, blank line, blank line, blank line, blank line, blank, yeah. You know. Every once in a while you find, even though this guy's a great programmer, he's got a very eccentric style for his code lots of blank lines. And I don't know what his motivation for that is. Notice he just puts blank lines around everything. Even every brace gets a blank line before it and after it. Okay. So he, and his, all his code looks like this. Yeah. And he's written a lot of code because he wrote almost this whole entire uh, system, this 3JS system, which is, like I say, it's a big, big three. Now it's not a renderer, like like what we're doing over here is we're writing a render. He did not write a render. The renderer here is your graphics card. He, this, his software sits on top of your graphics card. In fact, it even sits on top of something that sits on top of your graphics card. 3JS sits on top of what's called WebGL and WebGL sits on top of your graphics card. So his software is two levels above the renderer. The renderer is the, the graphics, actually it's three levels above your, the real render is your graphics card. Sitting on top of the graphics card is WebGL, and sitting on top of WebGL is 3JS. Okay, so so um, yeah, he, you know he's, he's several layers above the real renderer. So this is a library that makes the real renderer, which is your GPU, easier to use and gives you lots of lots of tools for working with 3D graphics. This is what a typically this is what game engines are like. Game engines are never renderers. Game engines always use somebody's render. It's almost always going to be either what's well, going to be ultimately your graphics card, and then sitting on top of your graphics card, it's either going to be OpenGL or uh, Direct DirectX, Microsoft's uh, library. And DirectX is not a renderer because DirectX uses your graphics card. The renderer is really your graphics card, your GPU. Okay, so even OpenGL is not a renderer. OpenGL is a library sitting on top of a render, which is all written in hardware, built into hardware, and OpenGL lets you use the hardware render. Okay. Right. So this is 3D graphics running in a browser using the 3JS library, which uses the WebGL library, which talks to your graphics card. Okay. And but this has become this is this is people really like his library a lot. There's a couple other libraries like this. The one that seems to be giving him the most competition is called Babylon.
and my memory is that Babylon has something to do with Microsoft. But this is the other very popular JavaScript 3D library. Okay. And it's, again, it's written on top of WebGL and under WebGL would be your graphics card. So it's really running on your graphics card. If it wasn't running on your graphics card, it couldn't do this kind of stuff. Okay. It's actually run, it's making use of your GPU. Okay. All right. So, all right. So these demos give you a sense of how to think about the camera. And that, that, that's a good start for understanding how graphic systems work. You know, we, we're going to make a lot of use. You know, we, we always have to worry about, we only see, you know, the graphic system only sees what the camera sees. So you have to pay attention to this view volume. And then there's this idea that the view volume can have two different shapes. You know, it's important to know that the view volume can either be an orthographic, let's see, uh, orthographic or perspective view volume. Okay, so you have to have one or the other view volume. Okay, if you uh, just show you real quick, if you go to the the demo renderer. Here's some 3D, let me go to the 3D objects. There's a 3D object. Well, let's go to something that's a little. I actually just go to the cow. There's the cow in perspective. There's the cow in orthographic projection. You can see over here, I'm using orthographic projection. And there is perspective projection. Notice it doesn't really look all that much different. But there's a huge difference. Here's the difference. In perspective projection, if the cow moves away, he gets smaller. If he moves forward, he gets bigger. If I go to perspect, per, orthographic projection, I'm tapping the Z key. I'm making the cow move farther away, but nothing changes. But see, if I go here, see, he's really going far away. See, pers the parallel projection, remember how the parallel projection works. If you remember the parallel projection, it's just a, it doesn't matter how far that sphere is from the camera. It always looks the same. If that sphere moves forwards and backwards, it'll always look exactly the same here, okay? Because the, per, the projection is parallel. So you see that here, the, the cow, I can't make him, you know, if I move the cow away, for example, here, I'll make the cow move real far away. So in perspective, he's pretty tiny little cow, but in parallel projection, he's the same size. And then here I can make the cow move back towards me, okay? And doesn't change this guy. Oh, let me show you a kind of a cute thing. What happens if you make him get closer and closer and closer and closer to the camera, okay? So now, if I look over here, over here, if I, tr if I use the M key, it'll show me where he is. So if I tap the M key, these numbers tell me where he is. So he's moved zero units in the X direction. So it's a delta Y. This is, this is how far he's moved from where he started off. So right now he has not moved, see all these are zero, okay? So he actually delta Z is 0.9. So he's moved one unit away in the Z direction, okay? When he starts off, there's where he started at. So Z is zero. So that's where he started. Now I'm gonna move him forward. So I'm moving him forward. See, Z is positive. He's moving towards the camera. He's about to hit the camera. When he's on the other, now he's on the other side of the camera. He's behind the camera and he gets flipped over. Same with the cow. See, the cow now is behind the camera. And you can tell that because the Z is, he's been pushed almost four units forward. He started off one unit behind the camp, in front of the camera. Then he's pushed four units forward, so he ends up behind the camera. Remember the camera, it's confusing. The camera is pointing in the negative Z direction. So when you move him a positive direction, a positive amount, he's moving towards the camera. And now he's moved all the way behind the camera. And we'll see why that happens. You know, why does he flip over when he goes through the camera? 
you can't tell these guys are flipped over because they're kind of symmetric. So you need to look at these to tell that they're flipped over. You can tell that these are flipped over. See, there now he's in front of the camera, and now he's behind the camera. Okay. So we'll see when we do the algorithms why the algorithms act funny this way. This is one reason why games have a near plane. This is actually one of the reasons why they put a near plane over here. Because in a game, you don't want a character to move front of the camera and all of a sudden appear upside down. So the camera just chops off and doesn't see anything that's in, over here. Okay, that's now. Real cameras, since they're based on real light, light can't somehow get into the camera from behind. But the mathematical algorithm that we're going to write over here doesn't care if something's in front or behind the camera. So in order to chop off things from being behind the camera, that's actually the job of the near plane. The near plane's there so that if objects move behind the camera, they don't all of a sudden reverse themselves and appear back in front of the camera like they do over here. When something goes behind the camera, he flips himself over and starts reappearing upside down. So we will need to put a near plane in our camera to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Because you don't, it's kind of cute to see it happen, but you don't want it happening in a game. Okay. And it won't happen in a real camera because light rays can't somehow bend around and enter the camera from the front. But the camera in a 3D graphic system doesn't use light rays, it uses math formulas. And the math formulas, the way they're written, they don't know about being behind the camera. Okay, all right. Okay, now let's look at writing some code to, to create a graphics picture. Okay, so in the renderer one folder, I want to look at this simple example. Okay, so let's, let's look at the code in here. The idea here is to look at a bare bones example of drawing a picture from beginning to end. Okay. And actually, what I want to emphasize is a little bit of object oriented programming. Okay, we're going to see that we're, we want to kind of get a sense of where the object oriented programming comes into this. All right, so I import the scene class because I need my input data structures. I import the pipeline because I need my algorithms. And I import the frame buffer because I need my output data structure. So there's the library. I'm also going to need a color. Okay. Build an empty scene, but it's not quite empty. It has a default camera. So build a scene. Instantiate a model object. Okay, now that's calling. Let me, let me, look, let me just go through the code. So we'll, as we're going through the code there, we'll go through the code there. Actually, so let's back up a minute. What happens when you create a scene object? Okay, so first thing we did is we created a scene object. So look at the scene class. The scene class creates a, there's the scene constructor. It creates an empty model list and a default camera object. What's a default camera object? Keep going through the code. A default camera object is a camera that says perspective is true. That's all, right now that's all a camera is. So by default, we're doing perspective projection, not parallel projection, okay? So our code created a scene object. The scene constructor created an empty list of models and a camera that is in perspective view. Okay, now go back up here. What comes next? Now we construct a model object and we pass it a string object. Okay, what does that do? So go open the model class. Now this is what you need to do. The textbook is this code. So trace through the code as a way of understanding what these things are doing. So just trace through the code to see how things work. So now I've got, I'm, construct, I'm calling the model constructor with a string. So what does that do? Okay, go down here. Here's the default model constructor. Now that's not the one I'm calling. I'm calling the one that, passes a string to the, but let me just first say what the default constructor does. The default constructor creates an empty array list, an empty vertex list, an empty line segment list. It sets the name to be the empty string 
it says this model is visible and I shouldn't be debugging it yet. Okay, so the model holds a vertex list, a line segment list, a string which gives you, lets you give it a name, and then a Boolean that says whether the model is visible or not. It turns out to be really useful to be make models invisible. There's almost every game engine has this ability. You, it's nice to be able to just set a model occasionally to be invisible so that it doesn't show up in the scene. Instead of deleting the model from the scene, it's nice sometimes to be able to just set this Boolean to uh, a false, and then the model disappears from the scene, but it's still in your data structure. Okay, that turns out to be kind of a clever thing to be able to do, to have a model in the data structure, but the model's invisible. So most every graphics library has a little feature like that, where you, don't, you could always just delete the model from the data structure, but then you might need it again later. So then you don't want to have to build it all over again. So it's nice to be able to just essentially turn it off. Okay, so a model has a, a Boolean that says, make me invisible. Okay, so the default constructor does that. Okay, now what does this other constructor I'm using? Remember, I'm using the constructor that passes it a name. Well, what should it do? Well, the constructor that takes a string calls the default constructor first. I shouldn't write any code that I don't need to. Everything to build a model has been done in the default constructor. So the this constructor starts off by calling the default constructor. That's what this means in a constructor. In a constructor, when you call this, you're calling the other constructor. So now that creates the empty model with a blank name, but then I update the name to be this string here. So build the default model and then update the name. Okay, All right. So now I've gotten through two lines of code here. So I'm through two lines of code here. I have an empty scene and now I've added, I've created an empty, I have an empty scene and an empty uh, model. Okay. Now I start building vertices and adding them to the model. Okay. Now, what does it mean to build a vertex? Might as well look it up. You build a vertex by going to the vertex class. And it's pretty straightforward. Actually, the vertex class is nothing but a constructor and a two string method. A constructor and a two string method. So that you can print them out nicely. And I actually added a couple fancier two string methods so that you can print them in more fancy ways with different amounts of decimal places. So it's a default two string and a couple fancy two strings. So essentially the vertex is nothing but a constructor. You just build it and all you do is store the doubles. Notice that a vertex, these variables are final. What does that mean? What does it mean to say variables are final? Uh, you can only assign value in a constructor? No, not quite. Doesn't mean that they can't be altered or changed as far yeah, as their they're, values? They're not really variables. They're constants. Okay, final means it's, it's it, C calls it C-O-N-S-T. C and C++, which is a better name. Final is kind of a weird name. Final means once it gets a value, the way you think of that is, a variable is final. It means once it gets, notice it doesn't have a value. Notice there's no values here. Final means that when it gets its value, that's the last value it ever gets. So you can only give it a value one time. So essentially they're constants. Most of the time in your Java courses, you've probably seen final variables used in a way where you give them a value when you declare them. But Java is actually a very, Java's got a bunch of beautiful tricks up its sleeve. When you declare a variable as final, you can, call, you can use what are called blank finals. What I'm doing here is called a blank final. And if you Google you'll see that the Java language has this idea of a blank final. And you can people explain it to you. It's kind of a, it's a very clever idea in Java. So Java has what are called blank finals. What it means is you declared the final, but you haven't given it a value yet. So you can give it a value later on, but when you give it a value, that value is, fi that value is final. That's why they called it final, not constant, 
because it's not really quite constant. You can give it a value one time. In other languages, these are called single assignment variables. There are some other languages that do this, but they're called single See, static single assignment form. There's different languages that have this static single assignment. Static single assignment. Okay. Means you can assign it's it's kind of like it's not quite a variable, it's not quite a constant either. You can declare the variable and give it a value one time, and then you can't change it. Okay. So these parameters come in, they get assigned to the blank finals, and we call that filling in the blanks. Okay, so you fill in the blank finals. Okay, that has the effect of making a vertex an immutable object. Once you create a vertex, you can't change it. Okay, now part of what I want to show you in this class is how to do really good Java programming. This is how to do, you know, how to really use sophisticated parts of the Java language to do things that are very useful. You know, use interesting parts of the Java language to create interesting things. This is a way to create an immutable class. The fields in the class are public, but final. Notice that this, now this is, so now public, you usually think, oh, if they're public, everyone can change them, but they're final, so no one can change them. So what I've created is an immutable object where I don't need get and set methods, okay? So this is a, a, a style of programming that's become real popular lately. It creates an immutable object, an object that once you create it, you can't change it, which is sometimes considered a good, good way to do things. And you do it by using these, these blank finals. So I have a public field so everybody can see it, but it's not, I'm not breaking the rules of object-oriented programming because those fields are final, so nobody can change them. This is a style motivated by functional programming languages. So it's a way of thinking about programming that's actually motivated by the world of functional programming. My variables are public, but they're final, so nobody can change them. So it's very object-oriented like, but the objects are immutable, okay? All right, so that created, now back over to the model, I'm sorry, back over to our code. I'm creating vertices and sticking them. Now that created the vertex object and then I'm adding it immediately. See, as soon as I create it, I add it to the, now notice that I create a whole slew of vertices and add them all at once. Now go back to the, now what am I, who's, who is this method? This method's in that object, so it's in the model class. Add vertex is an, a method in the model class. Go over here to the model class and look up add vertex. And you see another very useful trick in Java programming. How many parameters does this function take? As many as you need. I don't know if, I don't know if you've seen this trick. Like, let, let me open up something. Here's, here's a little bit of Java. If I have a function int f int x int y int z int w, how many parameters does f have? Seven. Pardon me? There are multiple. There's four parameters, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, what if I do this? Int f. How many parameters are there? It's an array. It's an array, but how many parameters are there? One. One. <laughs> One parameter, but it's an array. Mm -hmm. So that means you could have a lot of uh, ints. Yes. Here's a neat trick. What does that mean? You can have many integers there, like similar to the first one. 
it's it's some it's a combination of these two ideas together okay mm -hmm. like if I call F1, I say F1 of three, four, five, six, right? Because I have to pass four parameters. Okay. And I can do, but this would be a mistake. That would be a mistake. Okay. And F1 of, that would also be an error. Okay. Now F2 takes an array. So F2, I could I could pass actually um, I don't know, have you ever seen that notation? Mm, yes. Yes. What is that? Is that array literal? Yes, yeah, an array literal. I cannot do just that. That's not an array literal. What's wrong with it? You need to specify the data type. Well, it's int. Mm -hmm. When can you use that as an array literal? Assignment? No. Careful. Close. When can you use that in a legitimate form in Java? Is that right? Yes. Is that right? Mm. Not allowed. Why is it okay here? and not okay here. What's the rule in Java? What's the rule? Mm, you have to create a new. Like, yeah, you, this array <laughs> literal can only be used where? Initialization? When, in, in initialization as part of a declaration. Only can be used in the declara in the initialization of the declaration. Then you could use this notation. You cannot use it as an array literal to update a variable. If you want to update the variable, you would say something like this. Does that mean arrays are immutable? No, no, it's no, they're not immutable. No, it's just that this is it's just a quirky notation. Okay, you have to use this quirky little notation here. Now, what's the difference between that? This creates what? A new blank array of flat, of five slots. Yeah, but what do you mean by blank? That each of the spaces in the array doesn't currently have any data in it. No, it does. For ints, it does. What does it get by default in an int? Zero. Zero. If it was an array of objects, it'd be blank. But if it's an array of primitives, they get a value. Yeah, that's a trick. If it was an array of objects, then there would really be a blank array, you know, array of nulls. But if it's a primitive, it's an array of five zeros. Okay, 
and this would be an array of 15 zeros. What's this guy? What is this build? Array of four integers? With? That's an array of four integers. That's an array of four integers. What's different? The second one creates the assignment. Yeah, it actually fills in the array with those specific numbers. This fills in the array with zeros. This fills in the array with those specific numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. So up here, I can call F2 with something like new int, okay? And I can pass any size array I want in there. What about F3? Just let, let me pass, let's spend one minute on this because this is really useful. You guys, it's, I've, you know, this is something you should really, really learn. It's really useful to know this stuff. Notice F3 was declared this way. Which one of those is legal? All of them? I love yeah, all them. of yeah. them. <laughs> F3 is called a a ver arg variable argument method. How many arguments does it take? One, two, three, four, as many as you want. How does it work? Does it create an array? Yeah, it turns this thing into this thing. It creates an array. It puts these guys in an array for you. So that's why I was saying that this guy is kind of a combination of these two. You can call it with this syntax, but it actually builds the array like this. It's tremendously clever. It's tremendously useful. Okay, so see, that's how I can, that's why in my program, I can just say, put that many vertices. And it doesn't, I can put any number of vertices I want into the, uh, into the model in one function call. Because over here, I'm using var args. See, I'm using a var args parameter. And it's actually an array. So I iterate through it using array notation. I write an array. Uh, I write an array iterator here to iterate through this thing. Okay, we, we should quit there. We run out of time. This is the kind of stuff I want to be showing you. As we go through this code, you'll see lots of examples of very modern, very useful Java style. Yeah, uh, yeah we've seen a couple already. Blank finals. Using where is it? Using blank finals, writing constructors in a, com a compact way, using their arg arguments. We're gonna do lots of stuff like this. We wanna keep trying, you know, one of the goals is to say, here's how to write modern Java, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna be, so we're gonna step through the code. So we take an example like this, we're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll see, today's, what they, so, so on Tuesday, we'll keep doing this. We're gonna just go through this code real carefully and follow our nose through the code and see how the code is written and see how code works. And then also you wanna, so we wanna do two things. We wanna learn the Java code and also learn the graphics ideas. How does the graphics ideas and the object oriented programming idea, there's the, the graphics ideas, Java ideas, object oriented programming ideas. And we're learning all of them at the same time. Java, graphics, object oriented programming. Cause we're gonna make quite a bit of use of all these things. Okay, so ran out of time at this point. Go through this example like I'm doing here, and we'll, 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 we'll keep doing this on Tuesday. Just step through the code, and as you're familiarizing yourself with the code, go read what each of these things does in the library. They're almost always just a couple lines of code. 
Yeah. But then you know you'll start seeing things that you may not have seen before, and I try to comment things as, as pretty well. Okay. So anybody have any last minute questions? Any, any question at all before we quit? I have a question. Sure. In the frame buffer class, you use like a, a dot notation on the new keyword. I was wondering yep. what that is. Okay. That we'll say more about that when we get to the stuff about um event systems. What we're using ah, another sophisticated idea in Java programming, we're using what's called a nested class. See, here's the viewport. The viewport is an inner class of frame buffers. So if you want, you can Google the notion of a Java inner class. It's sometimes referred to as a nested class or an inner class. So this is actually a inner non-static nested class. Okay, it's an inner non-static nested class. It's one of the features the Java language gives you for designing things. And it worked real well here, but it gives you this kind of quirky notation. You know, when you create frame buffer objects, you do new after the dot. See, frame buffer dot because what you're doing is you're creating this object essentially inside that object. Okay, in a certain vague sense, this object is somehow tied to that object in a way that most objects aren't tied to each other. So the new is relative to him. So it does, it makes no sense to do this. That won't work. You can't just create a new viewport. You have to create a new viewport tied to a frame buffer. So you have this notation frame buffer dot new, and it's because of this inner non-static nested class idea. So that's and we'll be using them again. We'll use this idea more uh, again. So I was going to explain it when we get to render two when we start talking about event handling because we'll make use of a lot of different kinds of nested classes. But if, if you want, you can read about inner nested classes and it'll give you a little bit of sense of like what this thing is, is doing. What you think of it is a, a viewport is tied to a frame buffer. It's a viewport in a frame buffer. So that's why it's a nested class of frame buffer. Okay. And it's a weird notation. You've probably not seen it before, but if you start paying attention, you'll see it. It's used pretty often in Java programming. It's a nice idea. Nested classes are kind of a nice idea. Okay, any, anybody else, any other question before we quit? Any other question before we quit? I'll put these notes up on the website. Yeah, this is the idea of the VARARG arguments. Okay, so like this is a way to think about, you know, three kinds of functions. You know, simple, your usual kind, your array kind, and then this mixed up kind which is very, very useful. Okay, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing and I'll go ahead and end the meeting now. If you got any, if you got any questions about, oh, look for the homework assignment coming up soon, should be there today or tomorrow. And if you have any questions about the stuff we talked about, please you know, send me an email. Okay, I'll end the meeting now. See you Tuesday, bye.